Good morning, church. It's good to see you on this beautiful day. Let's stand together as we praise the Lord, lift our voices, oh, for a thousand tongues to see. great to see you this morning as we come together to worship. Let's prepare our hearts for what God wants to do. Let's go to him in a word of prayer. Holy Father, thank you for the privilege of being here. And the promises that you have given us, we come to those promises today knowing that you meet with us here and that you desire to work in our lives. Father, it's our privilege to be called your children, to be one that you created, you fashioned, you formed together, and one that you sent your son to die on the cross for so that we could be saved, to be reconciled to you. We thank you for your spirit by which we are led, by which we know you meet us here today. So, Father, as we come, I just ask for us to still our hearts. You would help us to do that as we just cast all our anxieties on you because you care for us. Lord, we know there are folks hurting in our midst. There are folks who can't be here due to various hurts and struggles today. We just want to lay all those at your feet, thankful that you're able to meet each need according to your will. Let us surrender to your will today. Your will for the issues that we face, but your will for this moment right now as we gather and worship. As you speak, Lord, let us be ready to hear and to respond. Be honored, I pray, through this time together. We ask your blessings upon this time. We ask for your forgiveness upon our sins. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
One of the ministries that we as a church have the privilege to support is Grace Water. And we have, uh, the last couple years, you have given either directly through the church or through the fundraising efforts of Grace Water. Uh, you have given over $8,000 each year to enable us to drill a well. And so I wanted you to be able to hear this morning some of the uh, updates, some of the advancements of Grace Water. So Nick, if you would come and, and uh, share with us, and she'd bring it in because she's really the brains behind the operation. And no so no I was honored to, from the start to have seen uh, this ministry begin and God's blessings upon it. So thank you all for being here and sharing with us today. Well, as Clint said, um, you know, as we're thinking about 2019 and uh, what's going on with Grace Water, I think the really sums it up is that it's it's a celebration time, and we've got uh, some some really good things going. An announcement we want to make to the church this morning, uh, but for 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 the people that maybe are not quite familiar with exactly what we do and how we do it, I'm going to kind of walk through our mission statement and how we operate how do we choose a community how do we um, uh, partner with a pastor uh, the first thing that we we look for when we are looking for a community or to take on a project is that um, that community has a what we would call a national or local pastor that we can partner with um, on the screen is our very first partner we ever had is it's a husband and wife team uh, Victor and Violet and uh, the reason we want to partner with a local pastor is because our heart is that through this pastor, a physical need is met. Uh, they have, um, are carrying water, you know, most of the time between one and three miles, a 40-gallon bucket of water. Um, and we want that to come through, the, through a national pastor. We want to put him at the center of the community to say, God's meeting your physical need, but guess what? There's a spiritual need that we want to tell you about. And so, um, you know... Pastor Victor here, he had uh, what we would call a water crisis. There's lots of different ways that people get water. Um, a lot of them are hand dug wells and rivers and streams. Um, depending on how close the um, current water source is determines if we're able to do the project. So if they got a water source that's maybe across the yard, even though it's hand dug and isn't the best quality, we may or may not drill a well there. But if, they're, if this well here is you know, a mile and a half away, uh, we'll definitely consider um, drilling them a well. Water quality is a big deal, so maybe they have a, a source that's close, but as you can see right here, uh, sometimes the water quality we wouldn't even give to our, our dogs here. Um, it's just stagnant water. And that's another, another thing. So first, two criteria we say we've got to have. One is a, is a pastor, because we want, as we meet their spiritual needs, we want somebody to be there to disciple them. Uh, to, uh, uh, I was visiting with uh, some of our friends and said, you know, what happens when, you know, we drill a well and we're gone and now that guy who uh, accepted Christ, his mom dies this year. Who's going to walk with him uh, as a new believer in that season? So, uh, again, our, our partner pastors are, are, um, are very important. So we drill a well, we, we, we accept a project, we um, uh, have a pastor partner, and we drill a well. Um, the next slide will show uh, the dedication. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar that much with Africa, but as they say, under the tree. Everything in Africa happens under the shade tree. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nothing flashy. It's nothing, you know, hocus pocus. It's simply a straightforward gospel message coming from their local pastor. This is one of the bigger dedications we had. It was probably 150 to 200 people. Uh, at this particular dedication and we preach the gospel um, to this community and at this particular dedication about 30 35 folks got saved uh, at this particular dedication and uh, so after the gospel is presented I like to call it the celebration begins well I got ahead of myself a little bit this is this is my favorite image one of my most favorite images we've ever taken so you get our pastors kind of do the uh, typical if you want to make a commitment today, raise your hand. And uh, at this particular one, these two little brothers both said, I do today. And there's a grandma, as you can't see in this image, but there's an 80-year-old lady that can't even stand anymore. She's sitting on the ground. So we had from 8 years old to 80-year-olds on this particular day. Uh, just a simple gospel message, meeting somebody's need so that they can hear about their, 
their spiritual need. This is another one of my most favorite images. So after the, the gospel is presented, uh, obviously it's time to celebrate that our physical need has been met. And uh, I think this sums up uh, how most communities feel. You know, if, if you've been drinking dirty water, uh, river water, uh, all these things your whole life, and all of a sudden now there's a clean source of water in your community, it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, they just celebrate. You know, uh, I think sometimes uh, we don't know how to celebrate uh, in the same passion and enthusiasm as, as they do. Uh, you know, I hope uh, we get free uh, one day to celebrate like David did in Scripture. Um, so, uh, you know, a typical well is your old pitcher pump well. Uh, and we are blessed that, uh, you know, Grace Water was birthed out of our, our church. Um, as you know, uh, me and Ann, uh, Roger Jones, Richard Pickens, uh, and then we've got two other board members that are from different churches. But, you know, the vision came right here out of Yazoo City. And uh, we're so thankful that y'all have partnered with us uh, from day one. Uh, so the next slide is just a, a snapshot. So we've been doing this for about three and a half years. What has the Lord done through this ministry, vision, uh, and... Um, and through grace water so that's what this looks like uh, six thousand roughly six thousand people have been served with clean drinking water uh, 1700 of uh, the six thousand people in that communities in those communities have heard a gospel message uh, 185 out of those 1700 accepted Christ at a dedication and we've completed 17 projects um, up until this point my turn mm -hmm. all right um, I, I just want to thank you. I simply say thank you for your support, um, not just financially, but um, praying and um, being a part of this ministry through so many different ways. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without you. And uh, in, in some ways, some of you raised me to have this mission mind and to serve and to love like Christ loves. So um, you're just, just as much a part of that as anybody. So I uh, wanted to thank you for that. So we do have a pretty big announcement uh, this morning, which we're really excited about. And so we want you to celebrate and uh, be excited uh, with us. So it was hard to think that three years ago, starting Grace Water, where everything would lead up until now. But uh, over the past year, we have just, our needs have been more. We've needed more help. We've needed more um, um, feet, on the ground. feet on the ground, if you will. And, uh, you know, the Lord does supernatural things. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing how the Lord will put this person in your life that puts this person, that puts this person, that puts this person. But um, we are happy to announce that uh, today and next Saturday, we are uh, beginning to um, let our community, our Grace Water community, know that we will have our first missionary couple that we're commissioning uh, this year. So uh, it's a big step. It's uh, something that the Lord has opened doors and uh, have uh, brought this couple into our lives. And uh, it's Herman and Ella Fury. Uh, they're on the third row. Uh, they've been with us for about uh, two months. Why don't you stand up and uh, so everybody can see you. And uh, just real briefly, um, they committed their lives to full-time missions in 2012 and have been working in, in the area where we have been working. And the Lord has just knitted us together, brought us together from across the oceans. And um, just, uh, it's, it's been an amazing journey and we are so excited um, that they're um, uh, gonna be part of the Grace Water team. Who would have thought that, they, uh, that the Lord, if you know me, I'm an ag consultant, that would have brought me um, an ag consultant that is doing missions agriculture in Africa that was a previous irrigation specialist. <laughs> it's like me from Africa. I don't know how to say it. You know, it's just the way, uh, the, way the Lord works. Uh, but uh, after the service, we'll be down front. We want to give you the opportunity to meet uh, our missionaries that will be uh, starting working with us in October. So um, anyway, I'm going I'm to let you... With the so you get another opportunity to support us this Saturday. We're having uh, a fundraiser gala um, at, in the Fellowship Hall at 6 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, Nicole Norman will be there. If 
I don't know if you know me, you know, I'm going to be a fan girl when she gets here because she is one of my idols uh, as a teenager. But um, she's going to sing for us and um, play the piano, and we're going to really enjoy that. We'll have a silent auction, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, we'll get to, to just fellowship together, eat some good food, and we'd love to have you. Uh, Valerie will be in the back if you would like to come. Um, you can pay your money to her. It's $50 a, a person. And all your money will go to drilling wells in Africa, which is incredible. So. And uh, last little side story. So I talked to Nicole last week, and uh, she said, believe it or not, I have been to your church and sang before. Uh, that when she started her career, uh, she opened for Avalon here she toured with many Avalon. years ago. Yeah. So uh, anyway. And just, she remembered all of us, so that was really cool. And I actually <laughs> sang at the prison, and the prisoners made them Wood Dove Awards. She said, I still have my Dove Award that, uh, so that from, from here in Yazoo City. So we'd love for you to join us. All right. All right. Thanks, Clint, Thank for you. letting us have time as well. <laughs> Thank you, Nick and Ann. What a, how an exciting ministry. What a neat thing for us to be able to have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together as we continue to worship today. <clears throat>
reflect upon how great our God is, we're reminded of how great we are not. When we compare ourselves to His glory, we say how little glory, how we really have no glory without Him making us known. There should be no desire for us to make a name for ourselves, for us to be made known. And we come today to Exodus chapter 2, where we see a journey that Moses makes that you and I need to make. A journey from pride to humility. Passages we look at the life of Moses that often we, we don't really focus upon. Now we, we skip over. We see really the first part, uh, as we looked at last week, of the Lord providing, uh, rescuing Moses and the plan that his mother came up with. And then as we left, she takes him back to be raised in Pharaoh's house. But then we come to usually the burning bush. We can't wait to get to that story, awesome story that the bush would burn but not be consumed. And out of that burning bush, God calls to Moses, speaks to Moses. But before that, God has to break Moses. Join me, Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? And are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and he thought what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to, fit to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to rule, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew us water and watered the flock. Where is he? Rule asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. If you go back to the days of being on the playground at elementary school, you may have played something similar. He's got various names. I think we called it King of the Hill. And if you could find a little mound of any kind, whether it's a little dirt mound, or if you stood up on some equipment, you would begin to gather you and your friends. I don't know who got first to be the king of the hill, but you would try to hold your position while everyone else charged you and knocked you off of the hill. And so that was the, you know, I can remember young elementary, that was the game for the boys because I was much larger. Uh, still am, but much larger at that time than most of my peers. And so I, loved, I liked the game because I was hard to knock off the heel. I mean, I had already learned how to get in a defensive position, one foot in front of the other, be, you know, have your weight distributed. When they pushed, I didn't back away. Or one kid would come up and push. If they couldn't knock you off, then the next one came and the next one. And whoever knocked you off got to be the king of the hill. Now, we grow up out of that game, so to speak, and we played on the playground, and we don't necessarily do that in a physical sense, but we still play king of the hill for we want to be on the top of the hierarchy we want to be at the top of the triangle of the food chain we want to excel and we should desire excellence in everything that we do we should do everything we have with excellence so not just haphazardly or halfway doing anything 
But our excellence often, as we want to excel, often comes at the expense of others. We have the idea we want to win at all cost, whatever we can to get ahead. And so we see that happen in families. You ever heard of sibling rivalries? That's what that is. We see we want to be on top. We see it happen at business, obviously. That businesses, many are marred by employees that can't get along because somebody at the advantage of others rose to the top. You see it happen, at, obviously, at school. It happens on the playground. It happens as we encourage our kids to excel academically, or they may do that at the expense of running over somebody to win at all costs. And we really promote that in our society, but it has a spiritual effect upon us. See, what happens is that we have some places, or maybe just one place, but everybody probably can go to at least one place or multiple places in your life where you're king of the hill, and you like it. And the longer you're there, the more you want. The more places you want to be king of the hill, the more control you want. And before long, pride sets in. It happened to Moses. Pharaoh's daughter prepared Moses for proper life in Pharaoh's court. Because Pharaoh had no son, had no heir, Moses was being nurtured for the throne. And Stephen, as he is being killed for his faith in Acts chapter 7, and in his defense... He begins to speak for himself and gives them a history of God's people. And he shares some things with us about Moses. That again, Moses was being prepared to lead Egypt. He was instruction and given instruction in the protocol, in the lifestyle, in the culture of how to be an Egyptian. Was given the best education. He took what would amount to Egyptian ROTC in school. For he was taught the ways of war. The Bible says that Moses' study and preparation made him into a man, quote, powerful in words and deeds. He made a name for himself. He earned the Egyptians' respect. By the time he reached 30, extra-biblical historians have told us that Moses has already led the Egyptian army to a smashing victory over the Ethiopians. All that to say this was one highly qualified young man, but he was also vulnerable Due to his pride. Most have the idea that Moses didn't know what God's will was for his life until he had the burning bush encounter at the age of 80. But I believe that scripture strongly implies that Moses has begun to understand his destiny while he was still a young man being educated in the Egyptian court. Before he reached the age of 40, I believe that God had already put into Moses' mind that one day, through some yet-to-be-revealed manner that Moses would lead God's people out of bondage. And that was what was on Moses' heart. See, he knew God's will, but he didn't know God's timing, and he didn't know God's ways. He was all about leading his people, but he didn't know how it was supposed to happen and when it was supposed to happen. And so instead of seeking God, Moses begins to carry out his plan according to Moses' way, in Moses' schedule. And as he did, things began to unravel for him, we see in this passage. D.L. Moody says that, or said that Moses, or that God spent the first 40 years, excuse me, God spent, Moses spent the first 40 years of his life thinking he was somebody, the next 40 years learning he was a nobody, and the third 40 discovering what God can do with a nobody. And in this passage, we see that second set of 40 years that Moses goes from pride to humility, and he learns he is a nobody. In his journey, he learned some lessons that you and I need to learn as well. The first lesson we see is in his journey from pride to humility, Moses experienced the results of fleshly motivation. One day, we're told in verse 11, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. See, somewhere along the way, he began to formulate a plan in his mind to rescue the people. Stephen says in Acts 7, 23, that it entered his mind to visit his brothers. I had to think that Moses, in his mind, saw the hard labor of the Egyptians. It was not hard to see, for they were everywhere. We see they were increasing in number. They're being driven as hard slaves. All this stuff is happening to them. They're everywhere. And Moses' heart is speeding up the process. I've got to do something to deliver my people. 
I think he went out to see what kind of following he would have. He probably thought, I'm going out, I'll have to fight to lead my people to freedom. He was anxious. He was impatient. And in that state of mind, he launches a premature attack that resulted in danger. It resulted in a man losing his life at the hands of Moses, and it resulted in a 40-year setback. It would be easy to read verses 11 and 12 and think Moses snapped. And he would have a good defense placed on trial. It was just a moment, temporary insanity, we would say. But that's not how Scripture explains it. Scripture shows us that Moses acted deliberately according to his plan. Did you catch it? Looking this way and that and seeing no one. In that moment, Moses became man conscious. He saw abuse going on and he thought to himself, now is my chance to make a move to rescue this man and people will follow me as a result. And so he acted swiftly and viciously energized by the flesh. Moses knew what he did was wrong. That's why he looked this way and that before committing the crime. He made sure nobody was seeing what was taking place. The law that he would later bring down from the mountain was already written on his conscience. You shall not murder. He knew he was in the wrong, but he was motivated by the flesh. And so he committed an act that set him back, and he began to experience the results of his fleshly motivation. Moses learned that spiritual ends are never achieved by fleshly means. He may have thought he was following God's plan in that moment, but we have no record of him seeking the face of God about what he should do before he struck the blow. And as a result, the bottom fell out of Moses' dreams. Verse 15 tells us he had to run for his life for Pharaoh was trying to kill him. The guy who he was going to take over his place is now trying to end his life. And Moses is on the run, beginning 40 years in the desert, all because he was motivated by fleshly means. You know, you cannot sow a fleshly seed and reap a spiritual plant. You can't plant a carnal act and grow spiritual fruit. So many times what we'll see is we'll see somebody connive and manipulate and scheme and lie to get to the top. And then they thank God for their promotion. But God knows and they know that they maneuvered and they pulled strings and they ran over people to get that place. And so God is saying, that was your way, not my way. Don't give me credit for that. Or students, you cheat on an exam and you get an A. Don't thank God for that. That's not God's way. That's your way. Adults, when you fudge on your taxes, you can get a nice return. Even if you plan to give part of it to some good means. Don't think that's God's way. That's your way. Those are fleshly motivations. Those are the instances where God says, that's your plan. That's not my plan. Don't give me the credit for it. Don't thank me for it. You did all of that. See, many times we find or we thank God for an open door that we pushed open. And we pushed and beat and, and kicked and screamed and cried and everything else. And it finally came open because we made it happen out of fleshly motivations. We cannot thank God for those. That is all our doing. That's what happened to Moses. Moses jumped into the scene. He pushed his way in. He forced the door open, and everything backfired. And he kills a man, and he's running for his life. We must understand that when God is in it, it flows. When the flesh is in it, it's forced. Spiritual leadership is God-appointed, not self-assumed. Moses wanted to be in charge, wanted to bring rescue. And so he appoints himself, assumes the position. And we're guilty of that. We're guilty of it in the church. We often feel, because a person has been successful in business, that they're a slam dunk to be a successful leader in the church. And that's simply not true. We look for what we would say are natural leaders. That's not who we're looking for. Instead, we should be looking for spiritual God-appointed leaders who may look completely different than their secular counterparts. What are our motivations? Through the years, obviously, I've encountered many of that as people come desiring to, to start ministries, 
Think of those come to start us wanting to start a Sunday school class. Ask why, and it's because, well, they got mad at their other class. Or they don't like the way it's being done, and they can do it better. And there's a fleshly motivation. People who will come desiring to do events. Put it under the name of outreach, but it's all about flesh for attention. So through the years, we've had conferences and picnics and block parties and other things, wild game dinners, you name it. We want to do this. Why don't we want to do it? And it's just silence. And it boils down. There's a fleshly motivation. They want to see something happen. They want to see something succeed that doesn't fit into what the church is doing as a whole. And so we push it through. We beat down the door. It happens, and lives aren't changed as a result of it. Usually there's something negative that happens as a result. Seeing as people desire positions, and so they manipulate and scheme to get certain positions. And in each of those instances, whether it's a, a ministry, an event, or a position, it's trying to fit a round peg through a square hole, and it fails every single time because the results are fleshly. Just as we're told in Acts chapter 5, as the apostles were being persecuted, they have someone to stand up for them. Gamil, who says this, Leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. See, many times we may push something, we may beat down a door, and we may think that we're successful, but give it time. We will fail as a result of our fleshly motivations, and we have to experience the results of that. Moses left that day, I believe, thinking, look at me. I've started delivering my people. When I go back tomorrow, they're going to follow me out. And he thought everything was positive from the start until... He went back the next day. And he finds two Hebrews fighting, two of his own men fighting. And he begins to ask them, Why are you doing this to the one that was the aggressor, right to the one that was winning? Why are you fighting your fellow man? Are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? And Moses realizes he doesn't have the following. Instead, he finds the second lesson from his journey from pride to humility, and that's that you cannot hide sin. Moses is found out. See, when you act in the flesh, you need to understand something today. You will always, always count on it, have something to cover up. Anytime we neglect to ask God's counsel, when we neglect to seek God's timing, when we step in and handle things, you will have a mess on your hands. Moses has a corpse, and it appears he picks up a shovel and a shallow grave at his feet, trying to hide the wrong that he had committed. And so today we face things that we're in our pride, we may have to bury our motive. We may have to hide a contact that we made to manipulate the plan. We may have to conceal a lie or a half truth. We may have to even backtrack on a boast that we made. And it's just a matter of time before the truth catches up with you. The sand always yields its secrets. And we're not good at cover-ups anyway. Moses could not hide a dead Egyptian. And by the next day, it was known. Hiding does not erase the wrong. Could it be that the reason as we look ahead at Moses, that Moses was tro so transparent with God through the years? is because Moses realized it's foolish to try to hide from God what God already knows. And so Moses opens his life up to God after that, being frank with God, being open with God, being transparent before God, because he realized you can't hide anything from God. This morning in Sunday school, many of our classes looked at King Asa, who tried to hide some things from God, and was told that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth, seeking those whose hearts are fully, seeking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. God is looking, what does He see? See, we're good at cover-ups. The most classic response of sinners is hiding. We've been doing it since the garden, right? The first thing Adam and Eve did was hide behind some bushes when they heard God walking in the garden after they have sinned. And we've been hiding ever since. And just as Adam and Eve thought they could hide from God, and we look at it and go, how do you think you could hide from God? He's all-knowing. He made you. He placed you in this garden. And he sees you. 
Yet we forget that God is all-knowing who made us, placed us here on this earth, and he sees us. We've been hiding ever since. We hide the consequences of acting in the flesh. We hide from ourselves the truth about ourselves. As Mark Twain said, we are like the moon. We have a dark side that we don't want anybody to see. But why is that? Why do we hide? Because listen, when we tumble, when we mess up and we cry out to God in our shame and our distress, the psalmist says that he inclines his ear to us. Meaning that God bends over to listen to us. Do you get the picture? That God on his throne in heaven with the angels declaring his praises, when you and I cry out in our distress and in our tumble, and God, I've messed up, that God inclines his ear, God bends over to listen so that he can remove the sin and the shame and give us his forgiveness and restore us. There's no reason to hide because God's going to find, he already knows, he's going to find us, but then he forgives us. 1 John 1, 9, if, if, we are, if we forgive our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So often we hide those things, hide them in our heart, hide them in the sand, and we bury these motives, we bury all this stuff that we shouldn't have, rather than coming to God and just laying at His feet, going, God, I, I've messed up. I've been motivated by the flesh. I said this, I did this. I've jumped ahead of you. I didn't wait for your way, your timing. God, I need you. Please take my shame away. Instead, we carry that shame. And that's where Moses is at. He realizes that he's been found out. And Pharaoh is after him. And I think it's there that Moses, the pride is out the window. Moses is facing deep humility. He's broken God then continues to work in his life. And that in his journey from pride to humility, thirdly, Moses developed a servant's attitude. He was confronted with another gross injustice. He fled to Midian where he sat down in a well. And we're told in verse 16 that the priest's daughters came to draw water and fill the troughs to, fill the, to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came along and drove them away. This time Moses sees not some slaves being abused by their master, but some women being abused by men. Apparently this was a long-standing conflict that the priest's daughters would come and they would draw the water and place it in the trough to water their flocks. And after they've done the work, these shepherds come to them and drive them away and water their own flock. And so for the ladies to water theirs, those guys have to finish and they've got to draw water again, fill up the troughs. And apparently this went on for a long time and took a long amount of time. So that on this particular day, when Moses steps in, their dad's like, hey, how'd you get home so early? How'd you finish up the work? You're never here this soon. And they begin to tell him about what had happened. Moses sees this beginning to occur that particular day. And he may have been a stranger, but he was not about to let an unruly band of shepherds take advantage of these young, helpless women. And it appears that Moses has already begun to learn some lessons because he doesn't kill these shepherds. He restrains himself this time, only using the force that was necessary to drive them off. And for the first time in his life, Moses is acting like a deliverer. After he re rescued the girls, he came to their aid. He watered the flocks, their flocks himself. And they had to be astonished because in this culture, it was unthinkable for a man to perform such a menial task for a woman. And Moses could have sat there and shrugged it off. Well, those poor girls, but you know, there's several shepherds. There's only one of me. Or it's none of my business. It appears this happens often as the ladies just bow out and let the guys come up. He could have made all sorts of excuses not to get involved in what he saw. But it was here that Moses took his first steps in becoming a man of selfless dedication. He stooped to serve, to serve someone who had nothing to give him in return. And by learning to serve, Moses was learning to lead. For all of God's leaders are servants. 
For when we go through God's Leadership Academy, one of the first lessons, the first topics covered is serving. Anyone who desires to be a spiritual leader should begin by finding a place of humble service. We've talked a whole lot about service in our time together. It's one of the priorities that we have as a church, to worship, grow, serve, and to share. And you've come a long way in over five years. For five years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of serving. We just paid somebody to do everything. And that was the mentality that we had. There was not a whole lot of serving here. And so I've made you uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Forced you to do some things that you'd have never done and you may not ever want to do again. To force you out and to make you serve somebody that can't do anything in return for you. But we have a long way to go before we pat ourselves on the back. And I think if we look in our life and we don't have areas of serving, then we probably haven't failed enough. And my question to you would be, how far are you going to have to fall? For what does a servant do? The next task. Whatever is available. Whatever he or she needs to do, a servant does that. And those without such an attitude resist getting their hands dirty. They don't want to get involved in the, ministry, the messy part of ministry, of working with people. They want the polished part, the fun part, the clean part. And that shows the pride that we have in our life. See, if you're not serving, again, you haven't failed to the point to learn service. And you're full of pride. Because when we fall, and we fall from that prideful king of the hill position, we learn the importance of serving. How far, brothers and sisters, are you going to have to fall before you begin to serve? You got to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness? That was just the first step that Moses had here. The next 40, he took care of sheep. Stubborn, unthankful animals. Not anything that they could do for themselves. As God continued to develop this servant's attitude in Moses so that he could lead his people to the promised land. Let us humble ourselves before God humbles us. Let us humble ourselves and make that decision rather than God forcing it upon us for the fall, the landing is much softer when we make it ourselves. Lastly, in his journey from pride to humility, Moses embraced obscurity. For he's in the desert. Verse, four, verse 21 tells us that the ladies go home, they tell their father what happened. He's like, well, why didn't you bring him home? The least we can do is feed him. Apparently, he was really impressed with Moses. And he asked Moses to stay. And by the way, if you'll stay, I'll give you Zipporah in marriage. And we're told... Chapter 3, that Moses, when he encountered the burning bush, is tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He's in the desert. See, the desert is a place of obscurity. Moses had to learn to cope with being a nobody. All his adolescent life, all his young adult life, he had been a big-time somebody. People paid attention to him. When Moses spoke, they listened. When Moses walked by, heads turned. When Moses walked into a room, he had everybody's attention. And he liked that life. And his pride continued to grow. And now, in his humility, he's with sheep. And sheep don't care who you are. You can say whatever you want to say. One man said you can turn backflips while reciting poetry, and sheep don't care. They're not going to be impressed. They're just going to grace Sheep are basically unintelligent, unresponsive animals. And that's who Moses was with for 40 years. Living in obscurity. Jethro probably didn't know where he was from day to day as he just went looking for green pastures and still water. As he made his paths, nobody was around. Nobody said, well, look, there's the next Pharaoh. 
Nobody talked about his education. Nobody talked about how great he was speaking. None of that. Instead, he took care of sheep. And imagine in his wanderings one day, he comes across a classmate. Again, given the best education, this person given the best education. Hey, Moses, what are you doing these days? Well, I'm a shepherd. He would have dropped his head as he said those words for this awful occupation in the eyes of the culture at the time. Maybe that classmate would have said, boy, I'm telling you, though, you've got to be the best shepherd. I don't know why I understand you would, you would take that occupation, but how big is your flock? Who takes care of them for you? Who does the dirty work? Moses would have said, I do the dirty work. I take care of my father-in-law's flock. I don't, I don't even have my own. See, where Moses was would have been very humiliating until you accept obscurity. To tell them, you know, all this education, I have nothing to show for it. I'm not even in charge. I just take care of my father-in-law's stuff. But Moses has humbled himself to the point that he accepts that. And he embraced the obscurity. And he did the job that God had laid out for him to do. In the movie based on the book, The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom tells the Lord that she wants him to use her in whatever way that he pleases. And soon after, she's taken a prisoner by the Nazis along with her father, from whom she is separated. Her father dies in the death camp, but she still has her beloved sister, and eventually she's forcibly removed from her sister. And the Nazis shove Corey into a damp, cold cell in Germany. And as that particular scene closes, she's lying in a corner, shivering. And with tear-filled eyes, she whispers to the Lord, But God, I didn't know I would have to be this alone. That's obscurity. Realizing you have nobody but the Lord. In a place where maybe you would have never picked to be. But it was a place that Moses settled in for 40 years. Willing to be obscure. To dwell apart from the limelight. And it forces us to ask ourselves, are you willing to be obscure? See, God will use the failure in your life to break down the desire to see your name in lights. He'll break the lust that you have for recognition. And when he does, you won't care if you're prime time or small time. You won't care if you're center stage or backstage. You won't care if you're leading the charge or if you're holding the baggage. You're just glad to be part of the king's army. You're available. And that's plenty. And that is where God wants us to be. See, in the body of Christ, in the church, we're referred to in Scripture as the body of of Christ and the body has various parts just as our body does the body of Christ the church has various parts and some people are called to be the toe not everybody can be the right hand everybody can be the eye the ear that people see the right hand that business is done with some people have to be the toe or the heel Maybe the kidney or the liver. Parts of the body that hopefully are seldom, are seldom seen. But just let one of those stop functioning for a while. And watch out. The whole body is in trouble. So we have to ask ourselves if we're willing to be the toe. To be the heel. To be the liver. To be the kidney. The thing that performs an important function but is never seen. And until we're willing to be the toe, we are not someone of humility. We may not think we're prideful, but there's enough pride in our life that keeps us from willing, being willing to embrace obscurity and do the things that nobody may notice. I look at Moses' story, I look at these four things, and I'm reminded 
of my ministry journey. See, as I wrapped up college, I'd been a youth minister for almost three years at that point. Crammed college into almost three years. I had two classes left. I was ready. I believe God was calling me to pastor. And about that amount, about that time, my home church pastor of 15 years retired. And I was his hand-picked heir apparent. He came to me and asked me if I would apply for the position, if he could give them my name. I was ready to go home. I had a great plan. I looked and I thought, you know what? I can go home. And no matter what they're going to pay me, I can live at home. I can begin to make a list of classmates that I knew would come to church if I was the pastor. People that I knew would be graduating and coming back home are going to raise a family there, going to be business people there. I could get them to come to my church. And I began to think about the empire that I was going to build. And then the church didn't call me. And I remember the brokenness that I went through. And it took a little while for me to learn why God allowed me to go through that. For many reasons, some for the church and some because of me. To humble me because everything I thought about going back home was a fleshly motivation. It's what Clint wanted. And it was during after that time when I went back and finished up those two classes that I wasn't going to have to go to school to take, but my plan didn't, wasn't right. That I learned what true service was when the first time in my life the scripture passage where Jesus washed the disciples' feet was pointed out to me in an exercise I had to do in class. And I began to learn what true service looked like. And I eventually, as I settled that in my heart, God gave me two great churches to pastor where God did amazing things there, and I got the credit for it. So I began to let pride set in once again. And I was a young guy then. I like to think I still am today, but it for sure was then. And so I would go places, and they would go, man, I'd be introduced as one of the best young leaders around. I later found out they can say that when there's not a lot of them. People would look and go, man, he's at obscure places. He's at places nobody knows about, and this is happening, and that's happening. I had great churches that followed. And I would have mentors say, you're going to be at this place, and you're going to hold this position. I would go to meetings, and I would walk in, and everybody knew me by name, and I had a place of prestige. And then God began to put a transition in our hearts, and we came here. And early on here, I began to wonder, I'm sitting around one day, and God, why, why did I have to come, not have to, but why did you send me to Mississippi? I don't know anybody here. I don't, have any, I don't know any pastors here. I don't have a network of friends here. I have nothing here. And God settled in my heart again, Clint, I brought you to a place where you're going to be in an obscure place. Because I'd begin to believe everything those folks were saying about me. Of how good I was, and what positions I was going to hold, and what kind of church I was going to pastor. And I remember thinking, why all those places in Arkansas that we talked to, and none of those worked out, why here? And then I go into a meeting, and I walk in, and nobody knows who I am. I go and sit down by myself, and those around me, we speak. But there's nobody that calls me by name when I walk in. I look and various things have changed. And as I looked at this passage this week, I thought, there's my life. That God places us in obscure positions, it's obscure places where nobody knows our name. But you may tell you who knew Moses? That was those sheep that he led. And so God gave me some sheep, some stubborn ones. Some very stubborn ones. But they don't care that my name's not in lights, and I don't care. And they're not impressed, you're not impressed with anything I could throw out. Instead, God has simply said, just he told Moses, I believe, you be faithful with these sheep. That's my responsibility, to be faithful with my sheep in an obscure place 
without the fleshly motivations, learn that lesson. And I'll have to learn it again, I'm sure. Realizing that we can't hide those things, we can't hide sin, God knows. God has a way of taking us from pride to humility and teaching us what a servant looks like and impressing that on our heart. And nobody may ever know it. And as I sat here thinking of sharing this with you, sat there Friday night thinking it's been on my heart, it's been a burden every day that I had to be this vulnerable. I'm convinced that from the top row of the choir to the top row of the balcony and everywhere in between, from right to left, front to back, Every one of us needs to take that journey. It's a journey Moses went on. It's a journey I've been on. Have you been on the journey? As you are here today and you consider being honest with yourself about your life, have you taken the journey from being prideful to being humble? Have you realized that your fleshly motivation of knocking down the door, pushing against what God wants you to do, that you're going to experience some negative effects of that? Have you learned that you can't hide sin no matter how much you try, that your ways are known to God and eventually they'll be known to others? You can't hide sin. You have a place of service where you have humbled yourself to put the needs of somebody else above your needs and that you don't care if anybody notices. It's time for us individually as a body of Christ to take a journey Pride to humility. And again, it's best that we make that choice ourselves rather than God having to force a journey to take place. Brothers and sisters, let us swallow pride today and be people of humility. Would you bow with me? Father God, I believe there's probably No word that cuts to our heart more than when we're convicted of the pride in our life. Because our life becomes all about us. And in this room today, I pray there are people that are experiencing that because God, it needs to happen. We came in here beating down the door, wanting what we want. We came in here with sin hidden, we thought. But you convicted us of that today. You pointed out how you know everything about us. We came here expecting to be served. And we're reminded of the call to serve. We maybe even came here ready for people to see us and know that we're here. and Maybe even lead in ways that people take notice of us. Lord, let us be willing to embrace obscurity and to not worry about what anybody sees but again be focused on what you see so Lord I pray for you to break our hearts today let us make the necessary decisions so that that happens with us playing a role rather than you having to force the issue God there are some here that have never never humbled themselves to admit that they are a sinner in need of your forgiveness. They've never been saved. And today they need to make that decision. Father, this is your time. Strengthen us to be obedient to respond to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together? As we sing, let the words that we sing be the commitment of our heart. As altars open, we're here to receive you as you come. Let us be obedient to God's call. Master, thou callest, I gladly obey. Only direct me, and I'll find thy way. Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my? Yeah.
I just want to ask you if you're ready and are you willing today? Are you ready for what God wants to do and are you willing? Are you continuing to push against that door? Can you answer to God? God, here am I. That willingness, absolute surrender. Heavenly Father, we pray this will be the prayer of our heart. Lord, please forgive us when it's been about us and not about you. May we always be willing to follow you, to be your servant, whatever the cost. Father, even now as we continue this time where we give of our offerings, Lord, may we continue to examine our lives and see what it is that you are calling us for. We pray this in Jesus' name.
fact that the Lamb has overcome should make a difference in how we live our life, and I pray that it will as we go this week. This afternoon, you have a chance to uh, support a young family that is starting through a uh, wedding shower. You have opportunity this evening if you are if you are a child in sixth grade and below or a parent of such a child for them to be here to have God's Word stored up in their heart through Awana at 5 o'clock. And if you are a teenager, a parent of a teenager, the youth small groups start back this evening at the same time. So I encourage you to be here at those opportunities. There's other opportunities in your bulletin you want to be aware of. Uh, but let you know that before you bring your kids to make life easier for you and our Awana workers, if you would register them online before then, you'll be thankful at 5 o'clock that you did. Uh, not that we would shame you if you don't, but uh, you'll be very thankful that you did how smooth things will go when you drop them off. Joey, Megan, if y'all would come, please. Uh, we did, are privileged when God works in lives and uh, desires, leads people to desire to be a part of our church officially through membership. And today, Megan desires to be a member of our church on letter from Holly Bluff Baptist Church. Uh, should have talked about the prodigal daughter coming home, right? So as uh, she returns home, and then Joey desires to be a member of our church through baptism. And I know that you are glad to have them make that decision. You're going to be supportive of them, prayerful for them, and encouraging to them as we journey together. As a demonstration of that, would you raise your right hand uh, to show your uh, commitment to them and your excitement for them? Guys, you see hands across the place. They're excited for you uh, and excited for the decision you've made. And they want to share that with you as we wrap up. Uh, Herman and Ella will be here. I ask for you also to come and stand here and allow them to welcome you into our church family. So I'll let you then to have a seat until then. And uh, as we wrap up today, we declare how great is our God. It's a story, not a story, but a song we sang earlier. It's a truth, I pray, that resonates in our heart and that it will direct us as we go. Let's sing that once again. If you'll stand together as we depart. How great is our God. 